There was good news from the art conservator. The paintings passed chemical and forensic handwriting analysis with flying colors. So I enlisted my brother and a friend, and for the next three years, we purchased nearly every painting the German seller had to offer. It was like catching butterflies. The deliveries provided a steady stream of dopamine hits as we identified and cataloged each new arrival. Richenko, Razanova, Popova, Exter, and Malevich. Over a three-year period, we acquired nearly 170 paintings. We'd purchased a museum. I thought I knew what we were getting into. Turns out, I've never been more wrong about anything in my life. My brother and I were born on an Air Force base in Lincoln, Nebraska. Our older brother made paper balloons and dreamed of flying. When the control tower spotted his balloons, they sent the military police. He was arrested and interrogated twice. Looking back, our mother would talk about those days and laugh. Our father was a nuclear bomber pilot for the Strategic Air Command. In his later years, he confided in me. His assigned target during the Cuban Missile Crisis was St. Petersburg, Russia. Back then, it was called Leningrad. 35 years ago, I saw an exhibit of Russian avant-garde art. I still have the catalog. The exhibit was a collection of one man, a mid-level Soviet bureaucrat. In Soviet Russia, this work was censored and forbidden. It was worthless. It was illegal to own. At times, it was even illegal to talk about. The collector discovered a discarded masterpiece being used to board up a broken window. The price he paid to acquire the work? A new piece of plywood. What I saw in this work all those years ago has never left me. It was transcendent art with a social function. It was brutally erased from living memory by the very culture that created it. Stalin banished, imprisoned, and executed many of these visionary artists. The work they produced was treated like toxic waste, removed from museum ledgers and hidden from public view. This collectivist, experimental art was produced in large state-run art schools, laboratories for dreamers. They believed art had the power to transform the world. It was always assumed that most of these artworks were lost or destroyed. Well, apparently we'd found some. In the press, there are inflammatory stories about fake Russian avant-garde artworks. A bizarre assortment of culprits were accused of fabricating these mysterious works. First, it was dissident Soviet Jews. Then they claimed ex-KGB agents passed master forgeries off to greedy and gullible Western collectors. Then came art historians, Western diplomats, and Western journalists. Nearly a dozen groups were blamed for the sudden appearance of works like those in our collection. None of the explanations made much sense, and they never offered any concrete proof to back their claims. In 2010, we exhibited our collection at Denver's Museum of Contemporary Art. We opened a tomb. During the last week of the exhibit, I was contacted by a German art dealer. I met him at the airport. On the ride in, he told me about art historians and collectors who've been attacked. He warned me about ex-KGB agents who work as art experts. He told me about paid off art historians and hack art dealers who fabricate lies about forgeries.
He told me about death threats. On our way to the eclipse, we were passed by reckless drivers. In the dense morning fog, one after another, they passed on the left, crossing the double yellow line into oncoming traffic. The day before, an art dealer told me, our collection is worth over a quarter of a billion dollars, and that the one person on this planet he wouldn't want to be was me. I thought about the paintings. I thought about forgeries, ex-KGB agents, and dissident Soviet Jews. We learned the main guy behind the forgery conspiracies is an advisor to Putin. Apparently, this art is important to someone. The bomb my father carried would have killed over a million innocent people. I never really understood what he was fighting for. After the exhibit, no one came forward. No institutions, no scholars, no serious journalists. I had a professor of Russian studies tell me that I should consider myself lucky to be alive. He said auction houses, dealers, collectors, even governments collude. He called it a transnational crime syndicate and that it's all about money. That they spread conspiracy theories about forgeries and that Western institutions are complicit. He told me they're dangerous. That if I continue down this road, to expect calls in the night. These paintings are haunted. On some of the canvases, there are underpaintings. An x-ray reveals a reclining nude. Another a still life. The artist who created this painting visited Holland in 1923 under the abstract composition. Infrared reveals a ghostly image of the artist's journey. An inventory label on the back of one of our paintings 1939, the last year of Stalin's murderous purge. The last year this art would have seen the light of day. My interaction with the FBI, they wanted to know if I'd involve myself in a sting operation if it turned out the paintings were stolen. The appraiser who valued 30 of the paintings at over $50 million. She wanted to sell our collection for a suitcase full of dark money on a deserted runway. My trips to Europe to find the truth. All I found were shattered lives. I can't get the connection to archaeology out of my head in relation to the paintings and this whole project generally. 
It's the idea of an art that's been hidden from view, locked away underground in silence and darkness, never to be seen by anyone alive. Someone searching for a pair of lost cufflinks discovered instead the doorway to a lost tomb. It's as if the Tramway 5 show was buried intact, sealed up and left still pumping out its message just waiting for someone to find it and translate its meaning into a different context. There's a definite similarity between the abstract language of the paintings and the form of Egyptian hieroglyphics. They are flat, spare, and meant to be absorbed in silence. Now, as Burroughs believed, probably mistakenly, hieroglyphics were not spoken. The Egyptian people had a different verbal language since lost. The hieroglyphs were a language of non-verbal signs which signified ideas within a shared spiritual culture, which we can now only intellectually absorb with great difficulty. The cultural gap between ourselves and the ancients is far too great. The distance between our time and theirs so extreme too extreme for us to be really able to relate to their artifacts fully. The intellectual climate of the early revolutionary system is similar. The same romantic myths and contemporary misunderstandings apply to our approach to both cultures. The paintings are relics from a world that no longer exists. A world as alien and exotic as the empire of the pharaohs. I've also been thinking a lot about the idea of names that can't be pronounced out loud. Of Set, with his forbidden name. The Lord of the Red Lands. The Lord of the Deserts to the South whose name was considered so dangerous to say that he could only be referred to by a non-verbal symbol read in silence. And also the spells from the Book of Breathing, the words which literally had the power to bring life back to the dead. Now isn't that similar to the names of distant intellectuals being wiped out of history, made unpersons, whose ideas were so potentially damaging to the state that their existence had to be literally erased and their work hidden so that it couldn't corrupt Soviet culture and derail the revolution. When I first saw the paintings, I felt as if I was being asked to abandon my sense of disbelief. The act of taking something purely at face value is very similar to the conscious act of blind faith made by the devotees of an ancient religion. After all, unless one makes an act of intellectual surrender, how can the spiritual content of these works shine out? You have to believe that the constructivist formal language of basic primary shapes and colors signify something beyond their actual immediate appearance. So the past resurfaces and breaks through into our present, bringing with it a disquieting reminder of how good intentions can be crushed by an authoritarian state. An Egyptian cat sculpture ends up as a paperweight on an 80s banker's desk while his city finance team advertised their money-making expertise by appropriating a painting by Rochenko. People today underestimate the strong spiritual streak that runs through constructivism. Now, we don't often realize how close Marxism was to religion. We don't appreciate how esoteric it was Concepts like the withering away of the state, 
the final victory of the proletariat are beliefs not that different from the faith in the final victory of Osiris over Set, the permanent separation between the black and red lands, the living oasis forever saved from the encroaching dead sand. It's the spiritual meaning of the paintings that finally shines through. Each one is a sign indicating a fundamental truth hidden inside a coded language. Circles, squares, triangles, the essential primary shapes and colors function as the building blocks of a lost language which we can now only intuitively assess. The geometric components of this language, derived from the nursery toys given by enlightened 19th century parents to solitary artistic children. Spelling blocks and abacus, picture books and colored bouncing balls, return as revolutionary icons, created to spiritually and politically enlighten the citizens of a brave new world. This is the one and only true religion tailored for a healthy worker living in a collectivist society. <laughs>